So we now move on to the second of the Society Awards, the Nick Hales Award. The late Professor Nick Hales was head of the Department of Clinical Biochemistry at the University of Cambridge, and he was also a physician um, at Addenbrooke's Hospital. And those of you who knew Nick Hales as I did, um, he was a fantastic expert in, in diabetes, and he, his, his main interest was in pancreatic beta cell insulin secretion. He made a major contribution to that field. But in the light, late 1980s, Nick Hales teamed up with David Barker, and he worked on the associations between fetal development and later disease. I wonder if that was done. Yeah. Um, knowing, and, um, <coughs> knowing that most insulin-producing uh, cells are laid down during fetal life, Nick Hales thought that poor in neutro nutrition could be harmful. And with others, he then showed that low birth weight greatly increased the risk of diabetes in later life. We're all very much familiar with that now. And that gave rise to the very important hypothesis stimulating uh, subject of the, thrif the, th the thrifty phenotype. And that's uh, certainly when I came into the field was up front there is that you're born small, your, your insulin secretory cells are compromised. And Sue Hosanna has taken that on, of course, in her lab as she was mentored by uh, Nick Hales. And what a wonderful person he was. So in memory of, of, of Nick Hales, Dohad presents this award at each World Congress to a DOHAD Society member who is a new and, em and emerging researcher that has shown an outstanding contribution to the DOHAD field. Uh, early career researchers and rising stars who are eligible for the award must be within 10 years of their first academic professional appointment. And so I, I have great pleasure in asking Nuruddin to come up and introduce the winner of the Nick Hales Award for Doha 2022, Nuruddin, thank you. Thank you, Lucilla. It's my honor to uh, introduce Dr. Emilio Herrera for the Nick Hales Award. Congratulations to you, Emilio. Dr. Emilio Herrera is a professor at the Institute of Biomedical Sciences, University of Chile. Dr. Herrera has extensively worked on animal models to address reproductive, developmental, and dohad related questions, particularly associated to the effects of hypoxia and oxidative stress in perinatal life. He is part of a selected team of researchers of the International Center for Andean Studies at the University of Chile and is the director of Research Center. Herrera's significant scientific contributions have been recognized through many of his national and international awards. Herrera's research transcends components of basic clinical, anthropological, and translational science with direct relevance to the significant advancement of knowledge on early origins of health and disease. With this introduction, may I now request Dr. Herrera to share his journey and highlights of his work. Thank you very much, Nordim, for your introduction. Uh, I would like to thank the organizing committee of the, of the meeting. It, it's been a really great meeting. It's been very diverse, in, in, uh, and, and I can really feel like the impact of, of Doha in every aspect, the clinical, uh, healthcare, basic science, public health, everywhere. So it's really an honor to be here and receive this award. And I uh, want as well to uh, uh, say thanks to Lucila and the Council of, of Doha that have selected me as an awardee. And uh, let me present my part of my line of research. So in this opportunity, I will show you uh, uh, just a short uh, story of an Andean tale story that it's my story. Uh, as an undergraduate stu student, I worked with Aníbal Llanos, 
and we were um, interested in looking for the cardiovascular response that the fetus have to chronic hypoxia. And soon after that, it appears that chronic hypoxia was uh, a, a very important programmer of uh, cardiovascular uh, responses in the fetus and afterwards in the, in the, in the neonate. And this is real relevant because uh, about um, one or two percent of our world population lives at high altitude. And they're permanently exposed uh, above 2,500 meters. Uh, so we have, uh, in, the, in Latin America, we have the Andean court that around, uh, it's the it's a most important uh, or, or the most dense cities that are exposed to high altitude. For instance, in La Paz, the capital of Bolivia, you have more, uh, about two million people. Uh, and in total, in the Andean court, we have near 30 uh, million people exposed to permanent uh, highlands. And as well, we have small towns or cities such as Putre, where we have our international research center. So in addition to this, there's a lot of work, high, high altitude workers, and particularly in Chile, as we have a long uh, mountain, we have a lot of um, miners, mine companies, we have uh, observatories at Highlands, we have boundary keepers, that they are constantly going to the Highlands, even above uh, 4,000 meters. So it's very relevant now with the new, new policies or, or, or politics where um, the government said that we have to increase uh, women in this kind of, of jobs. So it's, it's becoming more relevant uh, though had related problems. And pregnancy at high altitudes have some uh, complications. First of all, and, and this is not new, everyone knows this, we have a, a decrease in birth weight, and this is associated with an increased percentage of intrauterine growth restriction. This is a very nice paper published by Linda Keys and her, and her group, where they um, compared a population of Santa Cruz at high lowland and another population at high altitude in La Paz. And they show that there were several maternal, fetal, and neonatal complications associated with living at high altitude. In addition, Lorna Moore uh, show a relationship between uh, high altitude, pregnancies and birth, and birth weight. So you can see the inverse relationship and an interesting thing about this is that the ethnicities that have been more exposed to high altitude are more adapted to it. So Tibetans that have been for 15 to 20,000 years exposed to altitude have this uh, slope the Andeans that have been 10 to 15,000 years exposed to high altitude, have this slope, and then comes the European, and finally the Chinese Han that have been, uh, after the Tibetan uh, invasion of China, they have been 50 or 70 years exposed to high altitude, so have the steepest, steepest slope. So in Chile, the current, or, or, or in, the, in, in, in the world, the current uh, scientific challenge are to uh, uh, describe, in a way, the cardiovascular responses, the mechanisms that are behind them, and potential effective therapies. Uh, obviously, the most logical therapy is to give oxygen or to ask people to go down to sea level, but it's quite impractical that. Yeah? Um, so in Chile we have, I, I always say that this is a natural laboratory of hyperbaric hypoxia, and Aníbal Llanos, yes. and Aníbal Llanos, my first supervisor, he created the International Center for Andean Studies here ubicated uh, near Peru and Bolivia in the middle of the Altiplano, uh, with, deep, with this view that at any uh, latitude in Chile, you have less than 300 kilometers from the coast to the top of the mountain. So you, we can access the mountains in, in just a couple of hours. So we created this International Center for Andean Studies uh, 
and develop a chronic uh, hypoxia model with Aníbal, Roberto, and Germán uh, using a adapted mammalian like the llama and a non-adapted mammalian like the sheep, which is very similar to uh, our physiology in terms of um, uh, maturation and cardiovascular aspects of the fetus and neonate. So our first uh, uh, attempt was to try to understand how the llama was able to be delivered above 4,000 meters and run away from the fox or the puma that want to eat it. Yeah? So in a couple of minutes, the llama is able to stand up and run. So without any problems of respiratory problems or pulmonary hypertension. And we were saying, well, this is easy. This would be nit nitric oxide because nitric oxide was the clue for every vasodilator at the pulmonary uh, circulation. And we test, we block nitric oxide. We didn't get any difference. We uh, um, uh, uh, evaluate the expression of nitric oxide synthase, any, any difference. And still, we have this non hypertensive pattern in the llama and this very uh, uh, hypertensive pattern in the high altitude new more sheep. And by that time we have a uh, gas analyzers that were that gave us the uh, carboxyhemoglobin. So we say each time we see the, the, the gases we say oh, PO2, PCO2, yeah that's okay, we we get a, a hypoxic. But the CO2 was sorry the, the carboxyhemoglobin was increased each time the PO2 was decreasing the llama. So we said, well, here is a, there's a, 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 a production of CO carbon monoxide in the llama, and we evaluate that, and effectively, in the sheep was markedly decreased the, the, the production of carbon monoxide, and in the llama was increasing in high altitude. Therefore, the llama was using an evolutionary uh, selection of hemoxygenase, which is the enzyme that produces carbon monoxide, to create this intense vasodilation at birth. We were very excited about this, and we said, well, let's publish this in Nature or Science and, 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 and go for it, and was rejected everywhere. So at the end, we published, which, which is a, a good journal, Cardiovascular Research, we published it, and we were a bit disappointed. We would say, well, this is such an important aspect that the YAMA have selected that we need to, to expose it to the world. I mean. However, uh, we get to be a moment of famous in the broad broadcasting in Chile. So we have, uh, we appeared in the newspapers, we appear in the radio, which is, w wasn't that bad. Then we look after uh, for the cardiovascular, the, the, so it wasn't described the cardiovascular function during the whole gestation in a fetus at Highland at, the, at that stage. So we decided in this, in this uh, uh, center, we decided to instrument it, chronically instrument it, fetal sheep, to describe the whole evolution of the uh, cardiovascular function in these animals at 3,600 meters. And we replicate, so see, you can see that it's very similar to humans. The low altitude sheep weights 3.6 kilos, and the high altitude have a marked reduction in birth weight with 2.6 kilos. And interesting, we, we have a marked um, placental efficiency, decrease in the placental efficiency. This was associated, let me show you first the white circles, where it's the normal response to hypoxia, to acute hypoxia in a low, low altitude animal, sheep or human. You have a mean pressure with a uh, in slightly increasing in, in pressure during hypoxia, a bradycardia, and uh, intense vaso peripheral vasoconstrictions um, that makes this redistribution of the cardiac output during hypoxia. Yeah? And this was, uh, is associated with a, 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 a femoral ca contractile capacity. So in, the, in, the, in contrast, in the carotid or cerebral circulation, you have an increased carotid blood flow with a decrease uh, carotid vascular resistance, which make this brain sparing effect in the, to, to acute hypoxia. If you see now the, the, the black circles, which are the animals that were conceived 
uh, gestated and studied at high altitude, the whole response is blunted. So the animal have to blunt its response to be able to, in some way, survive to high altitude. The contractile capacity is marked decreased, and the, interestingly, the carotid contractile capacity was increased in these animals. So maternal uh, hypoxia markedly modifies the fetal cardiovascular response. Then we want to follow up this, this pregnancy and study the, the newborns to see how they, they were coping with this fetal to neonatal trans transition. And again, as I sh showed you before, there's a marked pulmonary hypertension. And we expose these animals to different uh, oxygen levels to evaluate the oxygen sensitivity to the pulmonary circulation. So we found that at any PO2, this is a pulmonary PO2, so this is normoxia, equivalent to sea level, and this is an intense hypoxic uh, episode. So we can see that at any PO2 level, always the high altitude animal will have an increased pulmonary uh, resistance and an increased reactivity to the, to the uh, Vascontractal reactive, I mean. Um, showing that there's a, a, a new setting of the pulmonary circulation and a different sensitive um, res or a different response to oxygen changes. And this was associated with an increased contractal capacity, probably associated with pulmonary artery remodeling. And again, we were expecting a decrease of nitric oxide uh, synthesis, but it was fully uh, the opposite. We had an increased activity of nitric oxide in this animal, an increased enos expression, and an increased phosphorylation of, of the, the uh, activator phosphorylation of enos. So um, this show that, uh, again, our hypothesis was wrong, and the, uh, uh, there's like a, a compensate, compensatory effect of enos, but it's, it's not enough to uh, go for the for the vas uh, uh, vasodilation needed for a proper pulmonary function. So chronic hypoxia during gestation impairs nitric oxide function in the neonatal pulmonary circulation. We follow up these animals and we keep a couple of animals. We take them to low altitude at Santiago and keep them for four years. And did the uh, experiments to see how was the pulmonary function in these animals. This is some published data at the moment. So what we found against our hypothesis is that pulmonary, the, the basal pulmonary pressure was decreased in high altitude animals and there was a slightly tachycardic, basal tachycardia. And if we expose these animals to an acute episode of hypoxia, as shown here, the pulmonary pressure wasn't at, as high as the normoxic uh, gestated animal and uh, the systemic pressure as well was not as high as the pulmonary, as the chronic, uh, as, sorry, as the normoxic animals. So we showed that fetal hypoxia modifies the pulmonary and systemic function at adulthood in these animals related to a pulmonary arterial hypotension and pulmonary and systemic hyporesponsiveness. This, with all this, this, this part of the story, we, we publish around 25 or 30 papers. And in the last uh, Doha meeting in, in Cancun, uh, there was a, a PhD student that was presenting at, at, at that meeting, and he was um, invited to publish a, a review about the model. And she did this very nice review where we we're showing all the, uh, uh, the mechanism that we have described, but as well some possible uh, involved mechanisms that are determining this, this function. As well, uh, just to show you the, the importance of having animal models, and in, in, for the sheep, for instance, this is a, a very nice collaboration, international collaboration, that was led by Jana Morrison, where we showed the uh, um, similitudes between the um, human pregnancy and the, and the sheep pregnancy, and therefore the usefulness of the model. Then I moved to Dino Giussani's lab, uh, where he was interested in chronic hypoxia and oxidative stress during gestation. This is normal hypoxia now, 
but we show that rats have uh, uh, the pregnancy in rats have in, uh, induced an increased remodeling of the aorta, and this increase in the remodeling was associated with a decreased contractile capacity. So the muscle, there was a, a, a bigger muscle, but it wasn't, it was impaired in, in its function as well as the vasoelectro capacity. So the vasoelectro capacity was as well diminished in these animals. So fetal chronic hypoxia impairs the aortic function and modifies its structure. Again, we follow these animals, and at four months old, it's an adult rat, we evaluate the endothelial function of femoral arteries. So this is uh, increasing doses of methacholine, which activate the endothelial, so it uh, dilates the femoral artery, this is the normoxic one, achieving near 80% of, of, of vasodilation, which, which is a healthy endothelium. And the animals that were gestated in hypoxia but raised in normoxia have a marked decrease in the endothelial function. And this was dependent on a decrease in nitric oxide independent component and nitric oxide dependent component. Yeah? Again, we said, well, where should the this is a very relevant discovery. It's the first time we are showing that developmental programming of cardiovascular dysfunction by prenatal hypoxia and oxidative stress. So send it to nature, send it to science, nature medicine. What do you think? Reject it. So we published it in PLOS Medicine. Unfortunately, fortunately, immediately after published, we get a comment in science website. So, there. And another model that I want to show you, which is very nice because we, you can isolate the placental and maternal aspect, is the cheek embryo. So the cheek embryo is just the embryo, and you have a, a set uh, uh, amount of food for the embryo, for, for the developing. And Dino was, was having some studies uh, uh, combining sea level X incubated in sea level, then sea level X incubated in high altitude. Can you see? No, you're not seeing the, sorry. You're not seeing the, the pointer. Uh, and um, sea level uh, X in high altitude plus oxygen, yeah? So with all this combination, Dino showed that the, the aorta was again in this model remodeled by a high altitude incubation and this could be reverted either by taking the, the, the egg hatching to low altitude or by giving oxygen. This was associated with, with uh, cardiovascular remodeling, spe specifically we have a left ventricle remodeling. So there was a, an, a, a, um, a vascular disease or, or, or probably a vascular disease in this chicken. And we again follow up this, this chicken low sea level and high altitude, and see the pulmonary, pre sorry, the systemic pressure, expecting a hypertension. Again, the hypothesis wasn't good, and we get hypotension, which usually is associated with healthy uh, cardiovascular condition. However, we expose these animals to a hypotensive and hypertensive challenge to see the pararefflex, and this is the normal response in the, the animals with the gain of the baroreflex. And when you did do, do the baroreflex in the high altitude gestated animals, you have a blunted response. So this heart is less able to respond to pressure challenge. Yeah? Fetal chronic hypoxia without nutritional or maternal changes then modifies the cardiovascular function and adulthood. This is very time expensive, demanding funding uh, uh, to go out to, to, to the highlands. So we decided to move the Andean mountains to Santiago and create a hypobaric hypoxia for small rodents. And at that time, we were working in, in placental insufficiency in guinea pigs and again develop a, a very nice collaboration with Jana Morrison and Max Perry and create this, uh, and, um, and many other people that some of them are here, and publish this paper about the guinea pig dohat model, which is quite nice because the reproductive aspects 
and the, um, sp the placenta and the uh, maturation, the cardiovascular maturation of the guinea pigs are very similar to the uh, uh, human. So our current research is focusing on the gastrotransmitters role of um, um, during hypoxia in the different vascular beds. And this is because um, uh, nitric oxide, uh, when you have an endothelial dysfunction, nitric oxide is, is quite depressed its, its function, and if there's any oxidative stress, its bioavailability is decreased as well. So there are two other gastrotransmitters that are, have been very understudied, which is uh, carbon monoxide and hydrogen sulfate. And the uh, extra good thing about these uh, gastrotransmitters is that they're enzymatic, uh, the, or the enzymes that synthesize them are not only in the uh, endothelial cells, such as nitric oxide, but as well in the muscle. So we are thinking that there might be a compensation of these uh, uh, enzymes in, in the absence of nitric oxide or any endothelial dysfunction. So we are performing this in, in, in guinea pigs and following uh, the cardiovascular in vivo examination by ultrasound every five days. It's a, it's a very uh, hard work for the veterinarians of the uh, bioterium. This is very preliminary data, but at, at one day old, these animals, again, white is low altitude, black is high altitude, these animals have an increased sensitivity to nitric oxide and have an increased uh, vasodilator capacity of the carotid artery against our hypothesis again. We have a problem with the hypothesis. And this was nitric oxide uh, independently mediated. So it seems that there are other pathways rather than nitric oxide that are enhanced during, pre during hypoxia but are not uh, uh, carbon monoxide nor hydrogen sulfate. So we are looking for other potential uh, actors in this. At 75 day, days of age, there's no changes, no, no differences in between both groups. So this improvement in, in endothelial function is totally absent now. And we think that the aging of these animals will show uh, 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 a, a, an endothelial dysfunction. So we're expecting to have in the next, I don't know, two or three months, the first animals that, are, that will be one year old. And in these animals as well with Alejandro Gonzalez, we are evaluating the blood brain barrier permeability and we have shown that at one day old, they have already an increased uh, uh, pass of albumin to the, to the brain tissue, which is associated with a marked decrease in tight, junc tight junction proteins. So in summary, gestation at high altitude impacts on prenatal development and cardiovascular function. Fetal hypovaric hypoxia impairs cardiopulmonary function in newborns and adults even when they are exposed postnatally to normoxic condition. And uh, I, I, I didn't show anything about this, but we have been proposing several treatments in these animals that we have uh, been successful, at least in the animal models. So the idea is to, uh, uh, as the, this has been shown in several times in the, like this diagram of the uh, chance of, inter of, of uh, intervention uh, decreases with time. So the idea is to intervene during uh, pregnancy or very early in the postnatal period. And with all this uh, hypoxia-induced cardiovascular response mechanism that we have discovered, now we are looking for collaboration to be able to translate this. Okay, so we're in the stage of trying to translate our um, findings into clinical area, particularly uh, in the high altitude population at the Andes. I would like really, really to thank, I don't know if I, this is possible, but to thank all the animals that we have used. We've used a lot of animals uh, under obviously several ethical uh, aspects, but never forget to uh, be conscious about the three R's. So whenever possible, replace animals 
whenever you can reduce the amount of animal to get, obviously, a statistically valid results, and whenever you can refine your data to avoid uh, stress in the animals. As David Sensory said, animal research saves lives, but whenever possible, alternatives should be used. And last, I want to thank all the people that have uh, join me in this uh, story. Um, as Peter uh, said, we are enjoying, really enjoying science. These have been highly motivated people, uh, interest just in, in knowledge, in, in looking for science, performing science. So thank you very much to all of them. I, I'm sure I'm lacking faces here, but there are a lot of them. I want to highlight Aníbal Llanos, that was my first mentor and Dino Giussani, which I think all of you know, <laughs> which I, I, was, I, I, was, I did my postdoc there at Cambridge. Thank you, Dino. This was, this was sorry, this had been said before, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. And I will add, and you'll enjoy much more the journey if you go together. Finally, I want to acknowledge my parents that are there. They came, they came here just for the, for, for the awards. So, gracias, viejos. <laughs> and, I, and I invite you, I would like to invite you next, uh, uh, next month. We're organizing a meeting with Amanda Sferuzzi Perry at London. Registration are still open. And next year in Chile, See you at Loja Latin America on September. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Dr. Emilio Herrera for uh, sharing your research work with us and your journey. And it's been so fascinating to see uh, the cardiovascular programming uh, merging in the Doha field. Uh, we have been uh, working along the cardiovascular programming in the animal models in an extensive manner. And also, one day we should see the data coming out from your team uh, along the, uh, the, the clinical side. Now with this, uh, on behalf of the International Society for the Doha, uh, I would wish to hand over the Nick Hales Award to Dr. Emilio Herrera. Thank you very much. Shall I say? Yes. This is not in the program, though, but uh, may I request uh, your parents to come out here and share the, the, the joy with Emilio, if that is okay with you guys. <laughs> By the way, she's a midwife, he's an obstetrician, and I was preterm hypoxic. <laughs> 